Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Aqu what it was the show called <laughs> the Aquariums Online Academy. Wow, we've been making a lot of these episodes. I don't know if any of you watched our last episode about uh, that ended about thirty minutes ago, but I just finished answering like I don't know, like two hundred questions on our text chain because me and Stewie and Dana, the three educators here today, have been taking turns doing the different jobs. So on this episode, Dana is behind the camera operating all the videos and stuff that you're going to see coming up behind me. Stewie is answering questions in our text chain. And I'm going to be doing our show to d for this uh, last show of the day. Uh, as we do with all the Aquarium Online Academy uh, shows, remember that you can call us. Or I'm sorry. Well, I really planned out what I was going to say, didn't I? You can text us if you have questions at 562-286-1838. Again, that's 562-286-1838. And if you text us your questions, and also what, uh, if you want to, what your name is and what school you're, call you're texting us from or where you, or where you live, uh, we'll be happy to give you a shout out on the show. And if we get so many questions we can't answer them all on the air, don't worry, Stewie's answering all the questions that we get in our text chain as we go here. Now, also, if you're watching the show post facto after the show's over, if the show's no longer live, you can still get your questions answered by emailing us at live at lbaop.org. Again, that's live at lbaop.org. And again, if you are watching live, you can just text us at the number right there at the bottom of the screen. So we have a really interesting subject to talk about today. You know how somebody, you know the old saying, the eyes are the window to the soul? Well, in the animal world, the mouth is the window to the stomach. Now, why do you ask am I saying this? Well, because by studying the mouths of animals, we can learn a lot about what it is that, that animal likes to eat. Even if that animal maybe went extinct millions of years ago, or even if we can only see the mouth or only have some of the teeth, we can learn a lot about how it is that anim what anim how it is that animals eat, what it is they like to eat, by studying their mouths and especially their teeth. Their teeth. So that's why I say the mouth is the window to the stomach. Not just in a literal sense, because you have to go through the mouth to get there, but also in a more broad metaphorical sense, because it teaches us a lot about what animals like to eat. So, the <laughs> so where was I? So for this particular show today, we're going to talk about an animal I'm sure you're all very excited to learn about. We are going to be talking about sharks, and we are going to be studying their mouths and their teeth and learning how we can look at a shark's teeth and figure out what it is that it might like to eat. So I want to first off bring up some of the sharks that we have swimming around here at the aquarium today. Let's look in Shark Lagoon for a little warm up here, and maybe we can see if we recognize any of the sharks that we see in there. So let's see, we've got a number of sharks. Of course, when we go to look on the camera, they're all hiding in the back. But I bet one's going to come by in just a second here. Wait, I don't want to jump in and block the view. We have, it looks like a black tip reef shark back there. We have a zebra shark I just saw swimming a moment ago. And also in this exhibit, there's a white tip reef shark as well. And, oh, that's the gray reef. I always, for, I always forget that the gray reef shark is in there. But yeah, the gray reef shark is there too. <laughs> and oh, here's our zebra shark coming around. So these sharks, you know, a couple of them look, and of course our our, our mangrove ray here too, and we'll talk about stingray mouths too while we're talking about mouths today, because stingrays and sharks, as you might have learned before, are actually kind of closely related. They're members of the same of the same family of fish called the elasmobranchs. Now, as we're looking at these sharks, right, some of them look like you would kind of expect a shark to look. The black tip reef sharks and the gray reef sharks, they look, you know, like they have that kind of kind of torpedo-like, football-like shape, I guess you could say, with the big triangular fin sticking out. But if we look at other, another shark in here, the zebra shark, who's courteously coming by, that shark looks way different from what most people expect a shark to look like. And that difference in its appearance is because it has a very, very different way of making a living than most of the sharks that are more famous, like great white sharks and black tip reef sharks and gray sharks and all that. And that big difference in its overall body is also a difference that we can look at in its mouth too. Now usually when you look at a shark, or any kind of fish, and you see that its tail kind of only sticks up on the top and doesn't really have anything sticking out on the bottom, oftentimes that means that that's an animal that spends a lot of its time moving along the bottom. And in the case of the zebra shark, we're going to learn what kind of a mouth it has too, and learn how that mouth helps it to eat the kinds of things that live on the bottom. But before we do that, perhaps I should say one more thing. When we look at the mouths of any kind of animal, 
you can you can figure out a lot about what they can what they can eat because you know you might have seen this before if you look in the mouth of an animal that only eats plants you know the teeth will be kind of the teeth will be kind of flat and there's not really any sharp points or anything like that if you look at the out in the mouth of an animal that eats a lot of meat then you'll see the teeth are sharper if you look in the mouth of an animal that eats both things like people for example great example of this we are omnivores right or at least naturally we can we can be we have teeth that are both good for biting through meat and also teeth that are good for smashing up plants. So we can kind of do both. But in sharks, it's not just a matter of whether the teeth are flat or sharp, because shark teeth are a little bit more delicate, you might say, than the teeth we have in our mouths. Because all of our teeth, right, we have a jawbone, and it anchors our teeth into our, into our, into, well, our jaw with these roots that go down from the teeth themselves, right? So the teeth are really stuck in there. Once you get your grown-up teeth in, they'll stay in there for a long, long time, unless you get in an accident or as we get older, you know, we start to lose teeth, but it takes a long time for that to happen in people and most other animals too. Now, sharks have both ups and downs with how they take care of their teeth because on the one hand, sharks grow new teeth throughout their lives. They, so they never really run out of teeth. But on the other hand, shark teeth don't have a root that holds them down into the jaw like our teeth do, which means that our zebra shark here, hello zebra shark, <laughs> our zebra shark there, and all the other sharks you see in there, if they bite into the wrong kind of thing with their teeth, they can accidentally, they can accidentally pull them out or, or break them off really easily, or at least easily enough that it's a concern. So that's why sharks are always growing new teeth, because they do lose them fairly easily. But, if they, but they can't grow them in an instant. You know, it takes time. So sharks have to be careful about what it is they're eating, because if they eat the wrong thing and they lose too many teeth at once because they broke them off on it or something like that, then they may not be able to eat for a while. And because their teeth have to be, are, so, are fairly delicate in that way, this means that their teeth have to be really, really specialized, which means that they're, they're, they're meant for very certain kinds of things to eat. And so a shark that might eat, say, clams, can't just suddenly one day decide that it wants to go eat sea lions. And a shark that eats sea lions can't just suddenly decide that one day it wants to go eat clams, because the teeth that they would need for those things are totally different. And we're gonna get to look at some of those teeth soon. We actually got our first question though, but we'll take, we'll take this one before we start uh, looking at shark, some shark teeth up close. Laura asked, do sharks have social interactions? Sort of. It depends on what you mean. Some of the sharks here at the aquarium do like to hang out together, kind of piling up on top of each other. If you've ever been to our, our touch pools at Shark Lagoon, you might have seen the bamboo sharks doing it. And that's a kind of social interaction, but it's not a really complicated one. It's pretty simple. There are some sharks that occasionally will swim together in large groups. Oftentimes this has to do with reproduction. Uh, there's sometimes sharks that might stay in those large groups during a period of migration. But there's not a lot of socialization among sharks compared to a lot of other animals. Like you don't see a lot of schooling sharks and stuff like that. If they are in groups, it's, uh, it's not that they, they don't really help each other a whole lot, if that makes any sense. But there are some sharks that do tend to, tend to be a little more solitary, a little less solitary. And maybe we can find, I'll have to see if I, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example of a more, of a somewhat more social shark. And I'll see if, it, we'll see if we can come up with any more. But that's a very good question, Laura. But like I said, the bamboo sharks are an example of a somewhat social shark. And they pile up on top of each other like this, by the way, because it makes them look bigger and it also makes them harder to find. If they all hide in the same place, a predator has to look a lot harder before they find something to eat. So, it's not kind of a useful strategy for the bamboo sharks who are kind of small. But anyway, I've been promising for about eight minutes now that I was going to talk about teeth, and we were going to learn how teeth can tell us what the, what the different kinds of sharks like to eat. So, let's begin by looking at the teeth of a shark. Now, a lot of the teeth that we're going to be looking at today, I'm going to go over to my camera to get an up-close view of these. A lot of the teeth we're going to be looking at today are replicas of shark teeth. Like, for example, these teeth here. Which, let me adjust the lighting here so that we can see it a little bit better. Let's see, I'll turn that down, start to see the shape. A lot of the teeth that we are going to be looking at today are replicas of shark teeth because sharks are animals that, you know, really need to stay in the ocean. And so we don't want to go pulling real sharks out of the ocean, and we don't. And you can actually get replica shark teeth, if you're curious, for yourself. You can, you can purchase them on the internet, uh, and they're, they, they're great for educational tools and stuff like that. Um, and this looks exactly like the real shark jaw of a juvenile great white shark. It's, it's, it's taken from what's called a mold of, the, of a great white shark jaw. And you can see when you look at these teeth that, well, 
That's kind of what you'd expect a great white shark to have, right? They're very, very sharp, and they're kind of pointy on the bottom. It is interesting they have kind of two different types. They got the pointier teeth on the bottom. They're a little bit thinner. Then they got these more triangular ones up top. This shape of tooth is great for the great white to basically do a kind of a scissoring effect with its teeth. What it does when it wants to take, when it wants to bite its food, is see, the, the thing is that great white sharks, you know, they like to eat stuff that's fairly big, right? Things like sea lions and things like sometimes even, even smaller species of whales and uh, things like that. So when a great white shark goes to take a bite, it can't swallow the entire thing all at once. And when a shark bites in, remember how I said their teeth can come out pretty easy? So if you imagine something like a lion or a tiger taking a bite out of a thing, like, you know, if you've ever seen like a nature video or something of a lion eating, you'll see them grab and they kind of hold it down with their paws and they, ah, I love, and look, yeah, I knocked my microphone off my ear. So we'll, go do, we'll do it on this side. So they grab and hold it down with their paws and they kind of yank and pull with their teeth, right? That's what you'll see a lot of predators on land doing because, again, they have those teeth that are anchored into their mouths really, really well. They have a strong root that holds them in. The great white shark doesn't have that. And furthermore, it doesn't have any way to hold its prey down. It's got, no, it's got no paws, right? So what the great white shark does instead, instead of tearing and pulling and yanking, it takes bites out of its meals by cutting the pieces off, essentially. So when this great white shark bites down, this, these triangular teeth up on top come down and the shark kind of works them back and forth against each other until a big chunk gets worked free of the animal. And it might, st might lose a couple teeth doing that, but that's okay because it can grow them back relatively, relatively quickly as long as it doesn't lose too many. But imagine if this shark, on the other hand, tried to bite into something really hard. Now, it's hard to imagine a clam that would be large enough for a great white shark to even be interested in it. But if you think like a giant clam, for example, that's, I guess that's big enough to have some meat in it, right? Even if a great white shark wanted to eat a big clam, what would happen when its teeth closed down on that? It wouldn't be able to cut through it like it could with the meat or hide of an animal, of an animal like a sea lion or a seal. Instead, this shark would have basically its teeth just break and pop off on that surface. So if you want to eat the kinds of things that have harder shells, you got to have a different kind of teeth. And a great example of the kinds of teeth that are perfectly made for eating things like clams and other hard-shelled animals can actually be found in that distant cousin of the sharks I was talking about, the stingrays, and they're all, their, all their other ray, uh, ray friends. I got a good question just now from Anderson and Allison. Do sharks eat other sharks? Yes, they do. Sometimes they eat even their own kind of shark, but most of the time they, they, they steer clear. Uh, there are sharks that, are, that will opportunistically feed on other sharks, and it de but it's not necessarily the most appealing option for a lot of sharks because other sharks might you know, have the same defenses, right? But one of the things about being a predator is that you have to take the food you can get. So sometimes sharks will do things that uh, will go after more dangerous prey.
All righty, and I hope that we're back. All right, so, sorry, folks, you know, we're, we're just learning how to make this show, so I forgot to put a new battery in my mic before I started. But anyway, because I was too excited talking about sharks. Now, uh, we were talking about the, the sand tiger shark, right? So the sand tiger shark is a lot of fun to discuss because when you first look at the shark, people are like, oh, it's huge. He's like 10 feet long, and he's got these big, sharp teeth sticking out, which you can, can't really see that well here, but don't worry, we'll get a closer look in a minute. And... People assume that must be a shark that goes after big animals and can, you know, rip, rip, rip animals apart and stuff like that. Actually, the sand tiger shark is a pretty easygoing shark that really only preys upon small fish. And this is because, although he has teeth that are very pointy, they are not good for cutting. So let's go have a look at an example of that kind of teeth. Now, I don't have a jaw from a sand tiger shark exactly. I have, however, teeth from a very, very similar or a shark that has very similar teeth. Uh, these are teeth from a mako shark, or again, a replica of those shark teeth. Now, and these, this, this jaw is so big that I can't fit the whole thing on the camera. Maybe i turn it sideways. Let's see here. That works a little better. Okay, so. So, if you look at these teeth, I know it's a little hard to see. They're pointy, but just to give you an example, they're not really sharp along the edges. I can run my finger back and forth along this edge, and it doesn't, I don't, I'm not worried about it cutting me. If I took a great white shark's teeth and did this, my finger would get a cut in it pretty quick. In fact, I actually have cut myself before accidentally handling some of our real shark jaws because they're still sharp. Um, but if you look at these teeth though, whereas the great white shark's teeth were kind of like, were like, kind of like steak knives or scissors, these teeth are more like needles. And I know needles does not sound like a fun thing to get bitten by, and it's not, but this does mean that this shark and this is a mako shark here, but again, the sand tiger shark here at the aquarium has very, very similar teeth. Basically, almost the same thing, actually, just a little bit different. The, this kind of shark, if he bit into anything that was too large for him or her to swallow in one bite and tried to pull a piece off, because this shark can't really cut with its teeth, that a lot of those teeth would get torn out. The shark would lose teeth inside of its mouth. So, it's very, very important for this shark, big as it might be, and the sand tiger shark gets to, be about, gets to be about 10 feet. The mako is, a, if I remember correctly, about the same size. Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit smaller, actually. Is the mako a little smaller? Uh, I forget. Yeah, I haven't actually thought about the size of makos in a long time. I realize I'm drawing a blank on this. But we'll see if we can track it down. But either way, they have a very, very similar diet and, a sim and similar type of food they go after. Though the mako is much faster. The mako is, a, if I remember correctly, actually the fastest of all the sharks. Um, something like 30 miles an hour or something they can swim. 42 miles per hour, wow! Do you hear that? The record for a Mako is 42 miles an hour, which sounds incredibly fast, right? That's, that's like car fast, but it's not as fast as some fish in the ocean. There's some fish in the ocean that can go 60 or 70 miles an hour. Some members of the tuna family can do that. So the Mako's, yeah, very similar in a lot of ways to the uh, sand tiger shark. Except the sand tiger shark, the sand tiger shark and the Mako are different in one very important way. The sand tiger shark just moves real slowly. Like, I'm not even kidding. This is about as fast as he moves a lot of the time. Waiting for him to come around to the window is pretty boring some days. I'll be like, all right, he's gonna be here any second. He's over there on the other side of the exhibit, and this is how fast he moves. And he does that because he's an ambush predator. The, the sand tiger shark likes to sneak up on his prey, and he doesn't want to create any waves or ripples in the water that they'll be able to sense. The mako shark, on the other hand, is like, well, I'm the fastest shark in the ocean, so I will just chase you down. But one way or the other, when they get to their prey, the kind of teeth they have are basically the same. They have different hunting strategies, but the sand tiger shark and the mako shark are essentially able to eat mi like middle-sized fish, small fish, stuff like that. If they try to eat anything bigger than that, anything they can't fit in their mouth in one bite, then they would have to, they would have to take bites out of it, which would mean they would lose a lot of teeth, because again, they can't cut their food like a great white shark can. Now there's one other kind of, kind of major group of shark teeth that we can talk about that kind of falls in between, I guess, this kind of style of tooth and the stingray teeth that we were looking at earlier. And that, a great example of those teeth would be from our friends, the zebra sharks, which we have some of here at the aquarium. In fact, I'll put up, a, I'll put up some real zebra shark teeth. As I mentioned, we have a lot of replica shark teeth that we use every day here in the aquarium. In fact, we provided some, this is an example of a replica zebra shark jaw. Uh, we actually provided some of the original replicas to the company that makes these now, or the original jaws to the company that makes these so that they were able to make replicas. 
However, back in the day before but when the aquarium first opened, we did get a lot of donations of real shark jaws, some of which we, which we used to accept. And I just want to show these to you because since we have them, they, we might as well get some educational value out of it. That's an example of a real zebra shark jaw. And you can see it's a little bit more colorful because it's, it's real and there's, there's the cartilage here of the jaw. And then the, the teeth are made out, of, made out of the same materials essentially as our teeth are. But let's have a real close look at these tiny teeth. So these teeth are real small, but they are still very, oh, this is, a nice, this is nice, it's working pretty well. Oh no, don't go out of focus. All right, there we go. This is a close-up of one, yeah. This is a close-up of one small area. If we can get it to go into focus, come on, you can do it, camera. Eh, eh. It's gonna figure it out, it's gonna do it. Come on, come on, camera. All right, I'll just hold it. So, there we go, bingo. So this is the lower jaw of the zebra shark. Look at those. Each, each tooth is like a little trident. You know that weapon that you like, you know, Neptune and Triton carry around with the three spikes on it? So those teeth are very, very little. Again, here's my finger right next to them. But they're very, very close together. Now, this shark isn't going to be swallowing any big, massive animals. And it's also not going to be cracking open any clams or anything like that. But this happens to be a really, really good mouth shape and tooth shape for eating stuff that's, you know, not necessarily big and not necessarily uh, fast, but that might be, uh, you know, sort of slippery or perhaps kind of, kind of hard. Things like shrimp that have kind of a semi-hard shell. Because these teeth are a good compromise between crushing plates and, and sort of gripping needles. There's lots of tiny little things to grip, so if the animal's a little bit slippery, if it's like a squid or a bottom-dwelling fish or something like that, the shark can still kind of grab onto it and hold it. And if it's crunchy, they can still kind of crack it open. So this is a really, really good... And where are all my questions, by the way? I should be getting more questions. I haven't gotten any questions yet, hardly. I do have one question, though, from Gage. He asked, how are great white sharks similar to makos, poor beagles, also known as the mackerel shark, and salmon sharks? Oh my gosh, Gage, you have me. Aside from what I just said about Mako sharks, I'm not that big of an expert on, 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 uh, on Makos. And aside from uh, knowing that poor beagles are also called the mackerel shark, honestly, I don't know a lot about them either. But let me see what I can get you while Stewie looks up the answer. Uh, for one thing, yes, <laughs> Stewie gave me some information. So the poor beagle, which is kind of a, I, I don't know if we can bring up a picture or not. I, I do remember they're a little bit of a funny looking shark. The poor beagle shark, and also, what a name, huh? Really, really, really intimidating. The poor beagle shark come in about, about 280 pounds or so. And remember, these numbers are always, always, you know, that's always, you should think of those as a range, right? So it's not that every poor beagle shark is 280 pounds, but maybe the big ones are. And come in about eight feet long at their biggest. The salmon shark, which I'm way unfamiliar with, is about 500 pounds and about six to nine feet long. And... Here I, who seem to know so much about sharks, I'm suddenly, and I'm suddenly caught totally off guard by a couple of shark species. Well, the thing is that there's like 450 different kinds of sharks. So, it's a, we learn new things about them all the time. Um, but a few things to get started though. If I remember correctly, those are both mid-sized, basically fish eaters, right? Yeah, they're both like mid-water swimmers. So, when you look at any kind of shark, by looking at its body, you can figure out a lot about how, how it lives. So even if you see a shark that you've never actually seen before as a species, you can usually deduce a lot just by looking at its body shape and looking at the kind of teeth it has, right? So if we can bring up any kind of uh, picture of, for example, is this the poor beagle? Yes, all right, at least I remember that much. So the poor beagle here, right, has a couple of things that are very similar to the great white shark in some ways. For one thing, it's got a fusiform body shape, and if this, if this picture is any representation, it's, it's a pretty beefy shark. And usually, and that means strength, that means it's a more muscular shark. So now that I'm looking at this shark, I actually wonder if it does eat some larger things that it takes bites out of, because those teeth look very great whitey to me. You see those, those kind of needle-like ones at the bottom? And also, this, this no, nose here, I'm, I'm getting a lot of things I'm starting to remember about the poor beagle shark, but, I'm to, but, I'm, but I don't want to say stuff that, I, that I'm remembering wrong. But if you look at this, right, this shark almost, in terms of its basic body shape, you could mistake it for a great white almost, just, you know, just kind of at first glance. So 
They have a lot of very, very similar characteristics, and I'd be willing to bet anything they're, they're fairly close relatives. And another thing you'll notice is that the sim a similar similarity in color, like most sharks do, you'll see counter shading here. This is, that's something that lots of animals have. That you find in all sorts of animals in the ocean, not just sharks, but other kinds of fish too, stingrays and so on. And so this looks like a pretty muscular shark that probably can, probably can feed on you know, things that are relatively large. And I'd be willing to bet that if we looked in the poor beagle's mouth, we'd probably find some teeth that are more similar to the great white sharks than I first expected. So very, very good question. But you, you kind of stumped me there, though. I don't know that much about that shark. Very, very good question. If you have more questions, though, don't just rely, we don't just have to rely on my knowledge. We've got Stewie, who's doing the research and texting on this episode. So we've got a couple minutes left if you have any more questions about how sharks eat, what their teeth do, how they work. And I got another one from Francis. Is there a shark with no teeth? That is a good question. You know, I wish we brought it here to the room, but I don't think we did. There are sharks, although there's no shark, so far as I know, that has, has no teeth, there are sharks that have basically teeth they don't use. There's a couple of different species of sharks, at least one of which you've probably heard of. One of them is the biggest of all the sharks, the whale shark. And then the other is a real interesting looking shark called the basking shark. They both survive by eating plankton. So instead of using their teeth to eat, they use their gills. So this is an op a basking shark with its mouth open. Weird looking shark, isn't it? Very wrinkly. But you see those big openings in the gills? Those gills have something inside of them called gill rakers. And gill rakers are basically little teeny extensions inside the gills. The gills are used for breathing, but they're also used in this case as a kind of a, as a, kind of a net. As plankton pass through the gills, they get caught in the gill rakers, and then every once in a while, thank you so much, Stewie, every once in a while, the basking shark closes its mouth up and swallows those things. And so the basking shark's mouth, as you can see, doesn't appear to have much in the way of teeth in it. It has these very, very, like, sort of remnant teeth. They're what we would call vestigial teeth. They're no longer used, but it still kind of grows them. And if you look at the mouth of a whale shark, this being an example here, and this is a replica, the mouth is very similar. I'd have to bring this all the way over to the camera, and this is pretty big, so it's going to be kind of cumbersome. But if you look, you see these teeth, they look kind of like, let's see if we can get it on there. They look just kind of like rows of like little nothing, right? Like there's not really a lot going on. And that's really all they've got. They're not sharp. I can roll my finger back and forth. They do have a little bit of a grip to them. So whether that serves a purpose or not, I actually, I would have to say I don't really know. Because the whale shark really just eats plankton. So that, that, that edge in the mouth, it might help to make the mouth a little more hydrodynamic or something. Because it does seem rather, it doesn't seem random. It seems like those teeth are growing that way for a very particular reason. But it is a really good question. And in any case, though, Francis, in general, there aren't sharks with no teeth, but there are sharks that basically don't use their teeth for anything or that have teeth that are almost nothing like we have here in the whale shark. You can see big, big mouth, teeth very, very tiny. Now, I want to show you one other thing about shark teeth before we wrap up. And, oh, that's a great question. We have a question from, uh, <laughs> from from somebody named Dave, if a shark liked Broadway musicals, what would their favorite be? Well, clearly West Side Story. I mean, I think that's obvious, right? The Sharks and the Jets. So there you go. Yeah, you got that one. Thank you so much, Dave, for asking us that question. Um, but before we wrap up, let's go look at one more real shark jaw. So, like I said, we used to sometimes get these donated to us, or sometimes we would we would, we would acquire them in the past. We don't anymore because the fact of the matter is, and we haven't for years, like 10 years or more, because sharks need to stay in the ocean and we don't want to do anything that contributes to that. But again, since I have this jaw here, or anything that, we don't want to do anything that, well, no, actually, we do want to do things that contribute to sharks staying in the ocean. We don't want to do anything that, that could impact sharks in a bad way. But again, since we do still have some of these old shark jaws, it's worth looking at for one last thing. I mentioned earlier that these sharks, and I'm sorry, this isn't a great white shark. This was, well, it's labeled blue shark, huh? I thought this was a bull shark jaw for years. Anyway, so if you look back there, you'll notice all those rows of teeth. Just as I was saying, sharks can grow new teeth. And this is something you can see really easily in, these, in the, in how, in this jaw here. You can see that these teeth in the front here are being used, right? Thus, if we turn it around, you can see how it looks on the front. 
And again, this is one of the bigger jaws, so it's not really going to all fit on the camera, but there you go. And this shark, by the way, has a, has a diet that's similar to the great white shark in terms of its behavior. It does take bites out of its food, but this one's not going to be going after stuff that's quite as big. And then if we look, you can see these active kind of teeth in the front, right? Those are the teeth that it actively uses to eat. If those fall out, a new tooth comes in from behind, rolls into place in a fairly short amount of time. And, you know, honestly, I actually have not, never gotten the, uh, it would vary depending on the shark, but I'm assuming that it varies from anywhere from, depending on the size of the tooth and the size of the shark, from uh, probably a, about minutes to a few days, depending on the shark species. But, and that's for them to move into place, not for them to be grown, which probably takes longer. But those teeth, you can see, we're all sitting there ready to go. So the shark grows those teeth, has them on standby, and they do sometimes, though, have them fall out, so new ones can move in. But if they lose too many at once, then they're not going to be able to eat for a while. So this is why sharks should be so careful about making sure they're using their teeth for the kind of stuff that those teeth have really evolved to eat. Now, we are gone over time, but, aha, thank you, Stewie. And I'm just going to say I, I feel validated here. Remember how I said that the, I bet that the poor beagle was a close relative of the great white shark by looking at it? Well, it turns out that I was, I, I guessed right. So, great whites, makos, salmon sharks, and poor beagles are all in family Lamidae, also known as the white sharks. So they're all, they're all relatives. So there we go. I learned something today, which by the way, I do every single time I come into work here at the aquarium or oftentimes working from home, which is what we're all doing when we're not teaching these classes since the aquarium's closure. So again, I hope you've enjoyed being with us here for the aquarium's online academy and learning about shark teeth. Remember, if you're watching this at home after the fact and you want to send, send questions to us, you can email us at live at lbaop.org. Again, that's live at lbaop.org. But other than that, we are through for the day. So thank you so much. Check out our classes and other programs online. Check out the Daily Bubble if you get a chance. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.